Good evening, everyone, and welcome to X Factor for Public Health. Uh, I'm Brahman Jeffries. I'm one of the governors of the Health Foundation. Uh, and I'm delighted to see so many people who are interested and engaged with this debate already in the audience, people who are involved in thinking, shaping policy, and hopefully will take away some fresh ideas at the end of this. I want to draw your attention, first of all, to the coloured cards under the seat in front of you. Don't kick them away. You will be needing them later. Uh, and so hang on to them, and I will tell you when you uh, need to reach for them. This event is also being live streamed for anyone who's watching remotely. Uh, they can use the Twitter hashtag uh, Healthy Lives, and if anyone who wants to tweet in the audience, please do go ahead. We want this debate to go as far and wide as possible. The Health Foundation is already known for its work in quality, in safety improvement, in reaching out to people who are frontline practitioners to tap into their knowledge and support their expertise in terms of driving forward uh, improvement and spreading best practice. But in the last year, the Health Foundation has also launched its Healthy Lives strategy, a very decisive step for the Foundation into trying to galvanise and be part of and work with other organisations to push forward the debate on improving the health on a population-wide basis with a focus on thinking about upstream solutions and how you can alter behaviour, which, of course, we know is one of the hardest things to do. Um, central to that is an ambition to shift the conversation about the way that we see evidence. There is, as we know, already a consensus that there has to be more cross-disciplinary thinking. The Academy of Sciences and its Health for the Public report 2040 recognise the need to build that approach, uh, to look deeper into the factors that influence all our lives, and to ask of decision makers that they use evidence and see evidence in a very different way. So the questions we want to explore tonight are how do we prepare for this challenging future with a burden of disease affecting the whole population and the need to shift behaviours? What sort of evidence, and more than that, what sort of reasoning, what sort of thinking tools should be considered? And how do we promote the understanding and the wider use of different kinds of evidence. Uh, I'd like to introduce our panel, first of all, uh, Ed Whiting, the Director of Policy and Chief of Staff at the Wellcome Trust, uh, Ilona Kickbush, Director of the Global Health Centre from the Geneva Graduate Institute, Merrill Davis, Center, Director of the Centre for the Early Child Development based in Blackpool, and Richard Horton, Editor of The Lancet, and uh, holder and curator of maybe in many ways, the current model of, of, of evidence. Um, what I'd like to, to be, before, we, uh, before we hear from our contributors, what I'd like to ask, starting with you, Richard, just a very quick answer from each of you, is why is it that we are so wedded to the current model of biomedical, uh, research-driven, in a very particular kind of way, evidence? Well, as you said, because of people like me. Um, I think the incentives are all lined up to support a particular um, way of thinking from funders through journals through academic reward systems, um, which do privilege uh, the biomedical sciences very much and create silos between disciplines. And so it's very hard to bridge between uh, a more traditional biomedical science discipline and humanities and arts um, even uh, built environment, politics, law, very, very difficult to incentivize collaborations. So we have to change the incentives. And I think that's the great opportunity for tonight to talk about how we change those incentives. Meryl Davis, you're involved in the front line of trying to change behaviors in a, a very deprived community. What for you is, is the way to shift away from very traditional models of thinking about evidence? For, for me, it's placing more value on lived experience, especially in complex issues like obesity. I think by engaging communities and really understanding through their, them and their lived experience, understanding what will work for them, what will make a difference, and then working with academics and with practitioners to actually try different ways and testing and learning different ways of, of working. But basically, for me, I'd like to see more value on the lived experience of the, of the person. Elona Kickbush? 
Well, I think uh, it's uh, not only the incentives, it's also the mindset. And a lot of what we call health research is not about health. Uh, it's about disease, it's about illness, and uh, the minute you think about health, you have to think complexity, you have to think context, you have to think meaning, and therefore you actually need uh, a much more integrated way of looking at the world and looking how people's behaviors are shaped. And in our modern societies, this behavior is increasingly shaped through a consumer-oriented and commercial environment, for example, and uh, we need to start to understand how those environments shape people's choices and uh, in what way political decision-making can actually have an impact. Ed Whiting, you, you're here from a, a big grant-making organisation. Mm -hmm. Do you accept that incentives are, are part of it, the way that we align all the incentives for academics and researchers? Well, they are. I'd, I'd briefly like to draw on um, the previous experience. So before joining the Wellcome Trust, I worked in government in Downing Street, and I saw policy as part of the policymaking process. And one thing when we think about evidence is just going back to what on earth policy is in the first place. And I worked on the obesity sort of policy as it was two or three years ago. Policy is about making choices. And it's about thinking about, if I do X, will Y happen? That's all it is. It's not that more, much more complicated than that. And when you think about that X and Y sort of question, scientific reproducibility is really helpful. So that's why RCTs do matter. But increasingly, thinking about human behavior as an input to that, and for po politicians, if they change the law in X way, how will people behave, becomes the whole game. So I think actually, weirdly, moving for me, moving from government to, to a research foundation, um, the policy space within government is already thinking much more broadly than this because they need to think about if I do X, will Y happen? I think in Welcome, we're starting to orientate ourselves towards this in policy particularly. We're being a lot more open about the sorts of evidence we'll, we'll want and we'll, we'll ask for. Um, but you are working in a culture where you're talking about knowledge creation often, which inevitably leads to research, to journals, to citations, to the very traditional sources of knowledge. So I think, for me, the first question is coming back to what is policy? What are we trying to change? And how do we get back to the what are my choices? What happens if I do that? How do I learn? And what knowledge do I need? Some great thoughts there about incentives, the disincentives in the system, the need to connect to real life experiences and the complexity that's involved in those if you're going to, to make progress. Um, we invited 15 people from very different disciplines to apply their reasoning skills to these broader questions, not just to think about a solution, but more profoundly to think about uh, could there be a different way of thinking through these problems that could be applied? We're lucky that five of them are here tonight to present their ideas to us. For the purposes of this evening, we ask them to think about childhood obesity. And uh, I want you to concentrate because you're going to be voting in a little while. Um, so that applies to the live stream audience too. We will be asking for you to vote at the end on who's made the most compelling case in terms of shifting your thinking about how we look at creating better health. Um, I'm first going to invite uh, Alex Mould, a modern historian from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, to come up and give us her presentation. <laughs> well, thank you, I think. I mean, it might seem strange to you that of all the different disciplines you could be hearing from, of all the people who could be talking to you, you're hearing from a historian, because history, of course, is about the past. So what can history tell us about the present, about our current situation, and indeed, maybe, about the future? Because, of course, there are plenty of critics who will line up to say history is interesting, it's fine for your BBC documentaries or your bedtime reading, but history doesn't really have anything to tell us about how we deal with current situations and current problems. I want to convince you that that's wrong, and it's only by thinking about historical evidence that we've got any hope at all of dealing with the issues that we face, such as childhood obesity. So I want to cover two broad areas. I want to say a little bit about the nature of historical evidence, how we can use it, and what unique insights I think it offers. And then I want to talk about how that contributes specifically to addressing the issue of childhood obesity. So historians make use of a vast range of different types of evidence. We use documents, published sources, ar objects, artifacts, and even occasionally statistical sources too. And we bring these different types of evidence together. We blend them. We, we test one against each other. We put them together alongside one another. 
um, to arrive at a picture of what we think happened in the past. The skill, of course, comes in blending them, in analysing them, and arriving at an interpretation. And of course it's an interpretation, and therefore it's always open to contestation, but I think the unique insight that historical evidence offers us, it allows us to think about change and also about continuity over time. And you can see that when you think about the, how that relates to the issue of childhood obesity. I think historical evidence can help us think about the extent to which this is or is not a new problem. And if it is new, what it is about our current situation that has helped to contribute to the problem and how it might be remedied. But secondly, I, also, I think the historical evidence can also help us think about how obesity and indeed childhood are constructed concepts. These are things that have changed over time and they don't mean the same thing today that they necessarily meant in the past. So how does knowing all of this, how does knowing this historical evidence help us think about childhood obesity? Well, I think we can use history to draw out three lessons. The first of these is that public health policies and practices have often been imposed on the most disadvantaged in society from, those, from a, those in a more advantaged position. And this applies if you think about the early 20th century, when the big, one of the big public health concerns was about uh, infant mortality and poor child health. And the way that public health practitioners went about remedying with this problem was they tried to uh, encourage working class mothers to be better mothers. They had practices designed to improve motherhood. But of course, the problem with this is that you've got middle, essentially middle class people telling working class people how they should behave. You're imposing a set of values on uh, people from above. And I think that childhood obesity is one instance where this might actually make the problem worse. And indeed, that's my sort of second lesson, that public health policies and practices can make an issue or elements of it worse and not better. And this particularly seems to be the case when individual behavior is involved. Another historical example might be uh, the 1980s and the HIV AIDS epidemic. In the early health education campaigns in Britain, made extensive use of scare tactics. And these scare tactics helped increase the sense of stigma that surrounded the disease and also the people that were suffering from it. And this had a very negative effect. So I think we need to avoid policies and practices that do this, as they can only make the condition worse. And instead, we need to take wider context into account when thinking about how we deal with problems like childhood obesity. Indeed, and this is my, uh, my final point, I think the one thing that perhaps we might all agree on is that childhood obesity is an incredibly complex problem, and there's not going to be a single solution to it. And yet, and this is my third lesson, complex problems are often presented as if they had simple solutions. And you can see this in many areas um, across time and place. One example might be illegal drug use, another complicated problem with no simple solution. And yet it's often presented as if there were two simple ways in which drugs could be, could be solved. On the one hand, you've got prohibition. Drugs would disappear if only we cracked down on users and dealers harder. On the other hand, legalization. Drugs would no longer be a problem if drugs were legal and all the problems associated with drug use would go away. But history, I think, tells us a rather different story. If we look at prohibition in America, the prohibition of alcohol in the 1920s and 1930s, Everyone remembers it as being a failure because the crime associated with the trade in alcohol increased. But if you look at some of the public health gains, actually alcohol consumption did go down, as did rates of liver disease, as did other conditions associated with alcohol. So in some ways it was a success. Now I'm not using this to say that we should necessarily ban sugary or fatty foods. Instead my lesson is more the way that we think about a policy and whether or not it's successful very much depends on point, the point in time in which you judge it and the outcome that you're looking for. So I think the historical perspective demonstrates that any attempt to deal with complex problems like childhood obesity may produce unintended effects and the way in which we judge the success or failure of a policy very much depends on what you're looking for and where you stand. So I think by drawing on historical evidence, we may yet avoid the mistakes of the past and make better policy in the future. Thank you. So I'm going to invite uh, our next contributor, Brendan McKettrick, an independent curator, writer and designer, to give us his thoughts. Thank you, uh, thank you very much. It's an honour to be here. Um, I'd like to start with a little story. Um, a couple of months ago, I witnessed... Um, in a tent in Dubai, I witnessed a group of school kids invent a game. Um, 
basically, sorry, um, basically they had just been introduced to a product which was experimental and under development. It was called Moon Pads. Um, and this was a product which had been developed by uh, design and engineering students in the Rochester Institute for Technology in the US. Um, basically what Moon Pads are, are kind of soft silicon mats that look like um, big psychedelic lily pads. But in, and they're kind of made to be very sturdy so that children can jump on them and step on them. But inside them are electronics which allow them to vibrate and emit light and sound according to predefined patterns which you can control with an app, basically. So in this tent in Dubai, there was no Wi-Fi, so the app wasn't working. However, for this group of school kids, this was a total non-issue because what they discovered through kind of uh, very vigorous trial and error was that if you applied enough pressure to these moon pads, you could get them to make sound and emit light um, simply through your own pressure. So what they did once they discovered this was spread them out on the floor and begin jumping on them and kind of synchronizing the chirps that the, that the moon pads would emit uh, in order to make a kind of uh, you know, simple melody. And they kind of transformed something which was um, you know, intended to be entirely different into a kind of music making device. And I was standing next to one of the designers of the moon pads when this was happening and I said to her, is this what you meant these to be used for? And she looked at me with like a, a look almost bordering on the euphoric and she said, no. You know? And I mentioned this because as a curator and as a designer, I think it, the transformation that, that took place there um, where you had something which was designed in one way and was used in an entirely different way says something um, important about the way evidence functions not only in design but also in curating. Um, I'm a design curator and one of the projects that I make is called Global Grad Show and it's an annual exhibition of the sort of most innovative design and technology projects from universities around the world and it was in Global Grad Show that this transformation took place where a, a product or a project which was designed for therapeutic uses was transformed to have musical use. And I think that what's significant about that is that both in design and in curating, user uh, feedback is really essential. Um, that's ultimately the, the form of evidence which is most valuable. Um, in terms of the design process, and particularly in terms of design of innovative products, um, you could kind of say that it proceeds according to a sort of structured instability. Um, designers begin the process often with a specific user in mind, a market in mind, uh, a desired outcome in mind. And then they have to structure their work. They have to design a set of criteria which are firm enough to mark their progress as they try to proceed towards this, this outcome. However, within this approach is a secondary idea which says that in the process of researching and conceiving and testing a design, it's almost inevitable that you'll be led in directions that you never foresaw. So a good designer, and many designers, um, basically have a kind of unique combination of rigidity and flexibility that allows them to, on the one hand, consistently and almost obsessively attempt to refine their work while remaining receptive to outside input. And the reason why I think this is important, particularly in this um, event, is that when people think of design, they often think of products. Um, and this makes sense, but it's actually the process behind the products that I think is more valuable here. Because the process that produces a lot of design products, and particularly innovative ones, um, comes from a process which is basically able to absorb contradictory evidence and, is, and has, a, has a view of failure which is um, basically sees it as provisional and instructive. Uh, and what this allows you to do is take an example like the moon pad. So for example, moon pads would, were, were originally created in order to help teachers to structure and, and focus the attention of autistic children um, teachers were having trouble, for example, leading children from one class to another. So these designers created this, this set of mats, which, which you can use uh, you know, in combination with an app to create a little pattern that allows the students to kind of flow from one class to another in a kind of direct and also entertaining and fun way. So this was the original idea behind moon pads. However, during this sort of process of development of it, they did some testing. And so what they did is once they had a prototype together that they were happy with, they brought it to a children's center and to a school and they said, please test this out for us. And what they learned very quickly is that there were many more uses for moon pads than they had in mind. And so based on the feedback that they received from schools, 
sorry, is that five minutes? So based on the feedbacks that they, that they received from schools, they, they altered the design and they, they, they made it increasingly flexible so that basically you no longer were dependent on an app. You could actually just with your own uh, you know, physical interaction call it, bring it to life basically. And this is significant because suddenly something which was designed to guide people can actually be transformed into something they can use to create something of their own. And this is what was evident in this uh, in this exhibition which I curated, where immediately something which was intended to be uh, quite structured in its experience was reevaluated by users and then changed by designers and then in this exhibition used in an entirely novel way by these school kids. Um, and I will just say, I have to very quickly wrap up, I, I didn't manage my time well. Um, that's, that's the essence of, of designing in a way and it's also the essence of curating, that basically what you're trying to do in design and curating is interact with the user in a way which is very difficult to quantify but is very important. What you're trying to do in design and especially what you're trying to do in curating is help people by intriguing them and then inspiring them. You want to get them to be interested in an unfamiliar object and then as quickly as possible get them to feel personally connected to that object and to understand that it's relevant to their lives. Um, yes, yes. Yes, so, so, uh, so I make one last point. Apologies for the sort of, uh, I actually did test this and it was on time. But anyway, the, fi the, final point, the final point that I'll make is both in curating and in designing, uh, there's, uh, it's very difficult to assess evidence and to uh, marshal evidence to uh, explain the success of whether or not you're having an impact on somebody's life. It's much easier to quantify things in terms of you know, the number of tickets to the exhibition you've sold, the number of column inches it generated, things like this. But I, what I would suggest and, and, and offer in this context is that it's very important to consider aspects of evidence which are experiential and therefore non-quantifiable because I think they still remain, even though they can't be understood in a sort of accountant's evidence, they remain invaluable to, uh, to change and to health and in this case to potentially childhood obesity. Thank you and I'm sorry for going too long. Thank you. And ju just a reminder for anyone in the audience and anyone watching on live stream that the hashtag is healthy lives. There's lots of thought provoking stuff uh, coming out of the debate already. Uh, our next speaker is Marisa de Andrade, a lecturer and programme director at the School of Health in Social Science. Marisa, please come up. One afternoon, I said to mummy, who is this person in my tummy? Throughout the day, he screams at me, demanding sugar buns for tea. He tells me it is not a sin to go and raid the biscuit tin. You hard child, my mother cried. Admit it right away, you've lied. You are the horrid, greedy, guzzling brat, and that is why you're always fat. So that's Jemima telling her counsellor she's been seeing for two years, she does art therapy with her, uh, that this is her favourite poem. It's a kind of massacred version of uh, Roald Dahl's The Tummy Beast. And um, basically, she, she told, told her that day that she wanted to tell her this poem was her favourite, and her counsellor asked her why. And she said, well, it makes me feel like it's not my fault. I'm not a liar. And it turns out, tragically, that Jemima's been abused, and she turns to comfort eating, and also on a subconscious level, she uses food to make herself deliberately unattractive to her abuser. So food makes her feel safe, and this is her subjective world, her inner reality. And she goes out onto the playground and she gets mocked and ridiculed by the kids because she is overweight. And she's in school in England, so she's part of the National Child Measurement Program, and she gets weighed and she gets measured. And she goes home, and her mother gets a letter saying, you are overweight. You can make some simple changes to eat more healthily and to be more active. But this is not simple at all because her mum has got two other kids and she's very poor. She has got a little bit of money every month to feed these children. She, she goes for cheap, unprocessed foods. And the reason she does that as well is not to cook them because it costs more on the electricity meter. It's complex. So my approach is called creative relational inquiry and it digs deep to a person's individual lived experiences and circumstances. We are interested in giving people a voice and the opportunity to express themselves in whatever way is right for them. And then we work with them to co-design services and policies and outcomes that are appropriate to them from the ground up, from the bottom up. So that is the thinking here. 
And we use this a lot in different communities. It's applicable to all people, but particularly with the marginalized and the deprived because, well, these are the most people most affected by child obesity. But also, you may have issues like language and literacy, or perhaps people in these communities may not have the capacity or be willing or able to actually engage in the ways academics expect us to typically engage mentally and physically. So Jemima, she becomes the expert, not me, and she decides what is evidence. A poem, yes. A diary, yes. Music, singing, theater, hip hop, whatever, yes. And a survey, maybe, well, a number. What happens if that number is meaningless? What happens if that number is inaccurate and maybe even misleading? So on a scale of one to seven, one meaning very satisfied and seven meaning very dissatisfied, circle the number that makes you feel most, well, give us an indication about how you feel about your body. Okay, so the one, which Jemima will circle, she's very satisfied with her body, basically tells us nothing. She, she eats because being overweight makes her feel safe. It's really often the stories behind the numbers that give us a real understanding of what's really going on here. And this is what we need to focus on. And I know, I work in these communities, that these approaches, creative relational approaches, do work. And they are valid and they are meaningful. But they're quite often dismissed as anecdotal and they're not actually appreciated by public health interventions in their design and in their assessment of efficacy because we can't prove things in the same way. But, but people are talking to us. They're giving us the solutions, they're telling us what they want, and I'm sorry, we're not always listening because the system is not working for everyone. So, I guess maybe you'll think it works for an individual, but then how does it work for a population level? We are interested in how the whole picture works, how the whole person fits into this obesogenic environment. So we are very aware of this, and we know that top-down interventions without really having an understanding of the lived experiences of people actually is not going to go anywhere. In fact, it's going to further stigmatize, and we're going to end up widening health inequalities and making things worse in terms of health issues. So my thinking is I doubt The Lancet is going to let me do a hip-hop rap in the, as research in their journal just yet. But I'm hopeful that we can all see the value of putting the person at the heart of public health. So understanding that evidence is whatever creative and relational form they choose, whatever is right for them, okay? Appreciating that the evidence ban needs to be expanded to include emotive types of evidence that tell us about the real underlying reasons, the real issues for why these things are happening in the first place. Personalizing, contextualizing this evidence, and then working with people, redesign by co-design. Okay? We understand that the macro and really understanding what happens at the micro level can then help us understand and come up with a complex matrix of solutions at the macro level. All right. And so I have one more thought, uh, and that is we're interested in how the individual connects to the system, but quite often we do that by form of numbers. So my last thought is we all have such varied different life experiences, so maybe please hesitate before you aggregate. Thank you. Well, to even broaden the debate further and bring in another dis discipline, we've got Professor John Coggan, who's a professor of law at the University of Bristol. So what can a lawyer bring to our debate tonight? Well, thank you uh, very much, and I'm very pleased uh, to be able to represent uh, law at, at this event. Um, I approached my brief perhaps as a lawyer would, although I should stress that I'm an academic lawyer, so I'm interested in understanding law and seeing how it operates rather than uh, in practice in it. So I look at my brief and I'm interested in the question of what evidence is in the context of public health. So I begin by looking at what public health itself means. Uh, philosophers who've looked at this say, well, public health relates to populations, which leads to risks of aggregation and so on, but we look at the health as understood at a population level, and that's where we find the sorts of uh, scientific research that we see published in journals such as The Lancet. A second, a second definition uh, of public that we find out relates to the use of institutions. So to quote Winslow, what we as a society do, the coordinated efforts of society, the organized e efforts of society to affect change to the health of the public. You cannot do that. You cannot do that without an understanding of law. It is law that underpins 
law that provides authority and legitimacy to, and law that constrains institutions. So it's all very well to have a policy agenda, but you need a mandate for that, and part of that mandate comes through law. And although this event is pitched as a competition, we heard in the opening remarks through what we've heard so far, this is very much about finding common ground. My argument isn't that law has the answers for public health on its own, but that law is a necessary aspect of public health research. So, evidence. I was invited to speak about evidence, and when talking to colleagues who are lawyers, they think about what's submissible in court and so on. Here, I think we're interested in systems of knowledge. Okay? <laughs> Academic lawyers studying law in practice are interested in legal rules. Of course they are, but we don't just spend our time looking at statutes and relaying what they say. You can look at them for yourselves. We look at them at different contexts and through different methodologies, including <coughs> political, economic, sociological, ethical. These give rise to contest, and the expertise that can come from law helps with the design of and implementation of public health measures. There are two ways in which the law is messy, and I want to describe these so that you can see both how lawyers help us understand it and how they might help resolve it. The first way in which law is messy is that law emanates from and applies to a multiple range of institutions. And different institutions, the evidence that they rely on, comes in the form of different sorts of reasons. Lawmaking institutions will primarily, I should think, be motivated by political concerns, policy and economic goals, uh, where there's delegated powers, for example, public health powers to local authorities. There will also be questions about the legal mandate. So the evidence, the reasons that you provide to political actors, necessarily must latch on to political agendas. Before we get the policy that we want to measure, we need to know why that policy is a good one. That's one area of messiness. There's these different sorts of reasons. The second area of messiness, which I think logically follows from what I've said, is that actually understanding law has inherent political overtones to it. So let me reference two legal academics. One. Professor Lawrence Gostin, who's a good friend of The Lancet, is, a, um, is, is interested in what we learn from social epidemiology and how we combine that with theories of social justice. Okay, he takes a capabilities approach to social justice and says, this is how we can use the law to promote better population health. But we can contrast what Professor Gostin says, which might resonate well with people in this room, with Professor Richard Epstein. Richard Epstein reads the same laws, looks at the same mandates, but through a lens of economic and philosophical libertarianism. For Professor Epstein, if we look at the question of child obesity, he will say that's a purely personal matter. The market can fix it, and anyway, it's no business of government. And the challenge for lawyers, the challenge for lawyers is to be able to respond to the lines of reasoning we find, for example, from Professor Gostin, from Professor Epstein, and convince policymakers, or as relevant judges, or as relevant executive actors, or in the current environment, perhaps commercial actors, that they ought to behave in a particular way. Now, we all know, we all know that health outcomes and opportunities are determined in large part by our social environment. And what I want to impress upon you is that our social environment has, as a strong determinant of it, the law both the law as it's written and as it's understood and as it's applied. Now, public health is a science, but it's also an art. And the art of reasoning employed by lawyers, what I'm characterizing as evidence for the purposes of this discussion, contains modes of reasoning that may seem anathema to what we generally call evidence-based policy. The sorts of evidence that we've already heard might be shunned uh, for being uh, not appropriately scientific. Law public health in practice require us to look at these evidence bases that extend beyond the scientific. And if public health activity is going to be applied in the real world, it will be done much more successfully if it takes account of the lessons that can be learned from law as I've characterized it. And that's my spiel. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Gordon. Well, our last intervention tonight comes from Professor... Karina Hawkes is the director of the Centre for Food Policy at the University of London. Karina, come and take your place.
you very much. Um, good evening, everyone. So if we're going to think about how to effectively address obesity, what I want to argue is that if we're going to get to what policies and actions are going to work, we need to understand how they work. That's what food policy can bring to the table, because we are single-mindedly obsessed with what will make a policy effective, what will make it work. So in the first instance, we think, if we're going to identify where policy can make the most difference, we need to understand how the systems work that underpin it. And in food policy, that means understanding the food system. And that involves delving down deep. It involves finding out why, when I walked through King's Cross Station last night, I was handed a free packet of Haribo's. <laughs> why? Because if you delve down into the system, you'll discover that companies, agribusinesses, when they take a grain of corn, a sheaf of wheat, a potato, and they divide that up into different ingredients, animal feed, glucose, uh, starches, into refined flours, into emulsifiers, that they create many, many ingredients that generate multiple value streams. So the starch that comes from corn or potatoes or wheat, that becomes the glucose syrup that forms most of these sweets. And that generation of value from the system provides a tremendous incentive for them to produce ingredients for the processed food industry because it's generating multiple value. And because those ingredients are so cheap for the processed food industry, that means they have a ton of cash that they can allocate to advertising and then giving it out to me free on King's Cross Station. 65.5 million do, um, uh, pounds, I believe, the confectionery industry spent on advertising through traditional media alone in 2015. So what does that mean for policy? It means that if we're going to identify transformative policies, we need to provide an enabling environment. We need to have policy provide an enabling environment for entrepreneurial business models that do not rely on the generation of multiple value streams, of overconsumption as a source of profit in order to work. Now, that would be transformative. But our second line of reasoning is that people are part of the system. They don't operate independently of that system. So we need to also gather evidence of people's experiences of that system. And that means actually going to talk to people who are disproportionately affected by the problem of obesity, which means engaging in areas of multiple deprivation. And when we actually start to talk to people about their lived experiences, we find that issues of price and availability, incredibly important as they are from a public health perspective, are not the only things. That food comes down to other things, our identity, who wants to be the kid in the class with the whole grain bread as a snack when you could have Haribo's? That's a matter of identity. It means we have to engage with the issues of the complexities of people's lives. If you're a mum with two jobs, working on zero hours contracts, and you have very little time with your kids, do you really want to spend that time with your kids peeling carrots and having an argument? Do you want to go to the local chicken shop and have a smile with some unhealthy chicken? It actually makes sense. So that's not to say that actions like restricting takeaways and giving vouchers to mums for vegetables is not important. It is, and it should be done, but it's not enough. If we're truly to address the inequity that we see in obesity, we need policies that meet people where they are. And that means doing different things, like engaging peer-to-peer -peer networks in the school playground in a different way. It means also working with people who are concerned 
with improving the working lives of women. And the third thing we need to understand is how policies actually work in practice. Let's take school food standards. Who can argue with school food standards? Is it enough just to have a study that looks at the outcome of those standards? That's important, but it's not enough. If we study the implementation of that policy, we might find out there were some kids doing an illicit trade in the playground of Haribo's because they haven't got them in school anymore. We might find that the dinner ladies are losing their sense of identity, which is so tightly bound up with getting kids to eat more, that when you transition away from fries to whole potatoes and from white bread to brown, which kids may initially reject, as a dinner lady, you don't like that. So it's bound up with their identity. And the problem is, is that that undermines, or at least it doesn't amplify the potential. You're not getting the bang for your buck from that policy because you're not engaging the people of the system. Now, does that mean we stop that policy? We say it's ineffective? Absolutely not. We continue with it. But does it mean we reject some criticism? We reject this idea that people are pushing back on it? No, we accept it and we learn from it. And we say, how can we design this policy to be more effective. And that means designing the policy in a, in a way where people feel ownership of that policy, where they feel it reflects their values and that they are part of it. And for the people who are never going to do that, it means having patience. Because we know that these policies take time to work. So what I've tried to argue then is that policies don't simply work or not work. We have to understand the policies better. And by understanding how, system, how, how systems work, how the food system works, how people's systems work, and how the policy systems work, we can identify policies that are more transformative, more equitable, and more effective. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Well, I'm going to ask our, our live stream audience to, to start voting. Well, I just very quickly sum up some of the, the, the arguments we've heard. From Alex Mulder, an appeal for the long view, not to just look at the short-term perceptions of whether a policy might be working or not, uh, and how, when we look back at previous attempts to shape behaviours, uh, those sometimes have been badly hampered by the stigma that was attached to the way that it was approached. From Brendan McKettrick, we saw how designers uh, have a much more interactive process with uh, the, the people who are using their products, thinking in, in about a much more dynamic, lived experience of how you might get to the end of a, a, a process of finding a, a solution. From Marisa de Andrade, uh, we had a little bit of verse, uh, an appeal for hip hop in the, the Lancet, which I, I hope I live to, to see. Uh, <laughs> and a pitch for creative relation, relational uh, um, imagining of people's lives to really go into their lived experience and to use the evidence that they give rather than the evidence maybe that, that we want from them. From Professor John Coggan, uh, we had the important question of who gives us permission to intervene in anyone's life anyway? Uh, lawyers, it seems, and the systems that law can provide for thinking about the right to intervene, whether it's a, a local authority or, uh, or a government. And finally, from Professor Karina Hawkes, uh, we heard about how we should meet people where they are, to take the argument to them, not to assume that we can impose uh, something on them, but also to look at the value added throughout the food system, that the more you have uh, a, a food production system which value is added by making ever more complex products, the harder it come, becomes to untangle that. Um, but also I thought a very good final thought there about uh, not just seeing policies as working or not working, that this is perhaps a journey. So now it's time for all of you who are here to reach for the folders underneath your chairs and extract the cards... And you will see that on the cards there is a, a colour which relates to each of our speakers. And so I'm going to ask you to hold up the cards 
with obviously the colour that is your preference facing me, not you, so that we can get an idea. And don't be shy. I really want people to hold them up so that I can see them uh, and get an idea. Uh, if you're ready, go, go ahead. Hold up, hold up your cars, and we can add this to the live stream vote. So uh, I've now got a bit of uh, creative relation, relational interpreting to do myself. I think that's a pretty broad mixture there, um, but quite a lot of yellow, actually. So I think we're doing, we're doing well for the, for the yellow, which is Marisa. So that seems to have made an impact, but actually a fair smattering. And I'm just getting the results here from um, the live stream voters as well. Uh, again, a real mixture, but Marisa coming out very strongly as having made a compelling pitch. So uh, I'm sure we'll have applause, applause for her shortly. But, but now it's time for the panel to, to react to some of the ideas we've heard. Um, I'm going to start with you, Ed, about this idea of policy working or not working and mm. maybe it being much more of a journey than devising a solution and then imposing or delivering it through the system. Yeah, so our, our challenge as panellists is not to split the difference between everyone and say everyone had something worth saying, but they did. So let's just get over that for a second. What was exciting about each of the propositions was that each, each produces a challenge to this apparent causal and predictive inference that RCTs offer. Because in social policy, making an RCT work in this way will be limiting um, when you apply it to something like childhood obesity. And each one of those, each presentation said what you need to not forget when you think about making policy in a social policy space. You shouldn't forget how your top-down interventions work when you do the law. You shouldn't forget what that means. But actually, if you forget about that multi-sectoral, comorbid, incredibly complex picture that you have to think about when you're looking at people with multiple needs, your policy will, will not be effective. And if you don't design it well, if people can't access your products, forget it. And actually, if you make the same mistake as you made 20 years ago or 200 years ago, you're wasting your time too. Um, so I think actually you've got to look at all these things together if you're going to make good policy on a complex, wicked problem like this. In thinking about the results here and the CRI, I would sort of say I, I, I am with it emotionally. The challenge still remains. You either need to limit the population that you're applying a policy to, or you need to try and look for trends that, that are difficult to find and infer from the nature of the analysis that you're doing. And I think that's the real challenge with something as emotionally resonant as CRI, which makes so much sense, is on a population basis, how do you then make policy um, that cannot be infinitely bottom up? Because the levers don't exist to do that. And we, they simply practically aren't there. So I love the emotional sort of resonance and I love the, the logical appeal of CRI. I think for me, the systems approach of food policy enables a slightly more complicated blending of the necessity of top down, unfortunate though it is, alongside a clear understanding of what it means for people. Um, and and, and meeting, the, meeting the people where they are as opposed to pretending that you can just do something from on high and it will work, because goodness, it very rarely does. Um, but thank you for the blend, again, of those, those different sort of ideas in, in making policy work. Alona Kitbush, we heard a lot about the complexity of people's lives and you know, questions about how, how do you systematically try and tap into that knowledge. What for you was leapt out from the dis discussion that we've heard so far? Well, I don't think we've talked enough about how we get policies. What's actually the starting point? Who pushes for a policy? Mm. How does a policy get adopted? How do we get the law? Uh, what, are the, uh, what are the power dynamics? What are the interests? Who benefits in the end? And how does that power game actually lead to a policy? What is the role of citizens in uh, formulating such a policy? That was indirectly there. We want to have a voice. And of course, if you think of some of the decisions, policies, regulations uh, that uh, followed within the context of the AIDS epidemic, very, that was very much the case. But we see, for example, that in relation to a whole range of the wicked problems we face now, obesity, AMR, a whole number of others, there is not such a clear cut civil society out there that says, this is what we want. There is nobody out there that says, I want health security, you know, protect me from the virus. There is a, a community out there that says, don't vaccinate me, I don't trust you. Mm 
So how do we get a policy? What's, uh, what is really, uh, what leads to the political choices that are made? What is the role, and again, our legal expert indicated that, what is the role of ideology within that? Because just as we heard people assign different meanings to uh, what they do and to their environment, so do policymakers assign different ideologies to this. And I think that is you know, a, a very, very important point. And actually, to understand that, there is a science that partly tries to do that, political science. But I actually think what uh, we could and should have had on the panel is investigative journalism. Because I believe some of the best knowledge we have received also in public health, just think of the tobacco wars, have come from investigative journalists who have really dug deep on how decisions are taken about corruption, about uh, barriers, about who benefits. Who benefits from killing people? And those are the questions that are much more difficult to follow through in academia because our incentives, even in political science, don't allow us to do that. But I really do believe we've got to get back to uh, you know, who does that digging deeper and uh, be incredibly thankful to the journalists who take public health very seriously. So, Meryl, you're at the front end of trying to capture that complexity in people's lives, the, the fact that a chicken shop might make for a happier family evening than a, a home-cooked meal for mm. someone who's very tired and working a long day. In practical terms, what's your advice to people trying to make policy at a, at a regional or a national level? How do they draw in both the lived experience but also this multidisciplinary way of thinking, different ways of looking at the problems? And I think certainly for us it is looking very differently. It's, it's bringing in academics to help us with rigour and to look at what needs to be considered but also going back to the lived experience using our communities and I think somebody mentioned co-production um, actually getting them to identify what the problems are why the top-down approach doesn't work for them, um, getting them to give us the solutions into what can happen, getting practitioners to pilot things and test things with communities to see what will make a difference. Um, I think if we can bring all of those together, I mean, it was interesting, um, the history bit. For us, um, if, we, if we look at the ACER research of the 1990s that went back, that was based on obesity. And from that, we learned about adverse childhood experiences. Um, that's something we really, really... Um, focus on and try and work with parents to look at those adverse childhood experiences. So I think it's bringing the, the history, I think, you know, the law, we, we certainly in the, the town that I live in use law as well to kind of address obesity in our town. But it's bringing all those factions together. But for me, it's actually getting the commissioners on board. So I think we can have all the academics, we can have all the lived experience, but if we don't get commissioners of services listening to that, and commissioning very, very differently, we won't make a difference. And is some of that about a fear of making mistakes, of doing things differently, particularly in a constrained financial environment? I think it is. You know, we're in an age of austerity. A lot of our commissioners and public health you know, have taken in-house cuts, so they're just going to recommission services, but maybe just trim a bit off. Rather than going out and actually saying to our communities, and we've done this with health visiting in Blackpool, we've just completely recommissioned it by talking to our community, talking to our practitioners, seeing what we actually need and want. And for the same envelope, we're now delivering eight sessions. Commissioners have got to start thinking very differently and using different evidence um, and voices to think about what they want to commission to make a difference for our families. Richard, the, the Lancet has published big landmark series of academic research around childhood obesity, mm. the, the tracking and the scaling of the problem. But what space is there in a journal like yours or in other academic journals to have this kind of debate where you've got very different disciplines bringing a fundamentally mm. more anecdotal, narrative-based way of, of thinking? <clears throat> well, I'm not going to be able to leave here now without making a commitment to publishing hip-hop in the Lancet, <laughs> am I? So, um, 
Just submit. Yeah. Submit, <laughs> submit, and we'll post. Okay, yeah. so there's a promise um, for sure. Uh, you know, I, if I can just say a little bit about what struck me as well about the um, presentations, because I thought that there are many common elements across the different disciplines, actually. Um, I think this, this privileging of personal experience, which we do extremely badly. You know, one of the worst things about this so-called evidence-based medicine was this terrible hierarchy of evidence that was created where the personal experience was put right at the bottom and really devalued. Um, and somehow we've really got to turn that upside down. And I think across all of the presentations we had, here this evening, that was very, very importantly identified. This issue of identity um, as well, constructed identities, what is it to be me? And therefore, and bringing in the issue of reasoning, understanding the choices I make. You know, one of the, one of the fatalities of the profession that I trained in, in medicine, and one of the terrible mistakes in every week that we do in writing our editorials is, we tell people what to do. Why should anybody pay any attention to us if we don't understand the lived experiences, the identities of, of the people we're supposedly, who are supposedly our audience? We need to stop telling people how to live their lives and understand why they make the choices in their lives. And that means giving voice. And that was another issue that came out, I think, across finding a space to listen to people. Stop talking. Let's listen a little bit more. Now, what can we do to encourage this more pluralistic environment, I completely agree. Um, you know, I was looking back, we have a public health science conference that we've been holding every year for the last three or four years with uh, mainly early career researchers. And actually, of about 100 abstracts we publish every year, only, I mean, four or five are randomized trials. The rest are qualitative research, mixed methods research, we had a historical piece published recently, Harry Rutter, who's here, I think. You know, you were at our conference, Harry, and saw that at the end of last year. You know, there is an enormously rich literature out there that we are seeing come through now, which is breaking apart this stranglehold of traditional epidemiology. And that is a very, very encouraging sign, I, th I think. And also, if I, if I may say, it is up to journals to lead that. And the one example I would give, we have uh, what we call commissions, where we bring together people from different disciplines. And you kindly mentioned Larry Gostin. We have a Global Health Law Commission, where it's all populated by lawyers. Um, and that's fascinating to look at the different evidence that they use to think about what can law contribute to health. So I think journals can be the catalyst, the convening points, to bring different disciplines together. So my question to the rest of the panel then is, how do you bridge the gap between that leading of the debate and the kind of co-production that we, meeting people where they are, or taking something out, as Brendan was talking about, and then seeing it repurposed through, through people's lived experience? How do, how do you build that into feedback so you're not just pumping something out and waiting for five or ten years to see if it has any impact? Any thoughts? Ed? Well, it's sort of the driving scale in the public sector challenge. How do you take something that you can see works, so a different commissioning practice that leads to more effective interventions driven by health visitors, and say, well, what do we do about that at a regional and a national level? And that's the bit that in the public sector, you know, I'd say we or they, have not have always struggled to do. And, and it's partly about the human behavior of commissioners and of the people working in regional places and in, and in national sort of policy making centers. And as Alona says, you need to be at that, those sort of levels, you then need to say, well, how does the learned experience and the lived experience at a local level conflict with the political imperatives at a regional level or a national level and the financial imperatives and the other, the other economies that you need to work with? And that's the thing that we really struggle to break down. We might know what might work particularly well in a particular community or set of, set of communities, but then we can't get it to work over there because the politics stops us or the money stops us or whatever. And I don't know quite how we get it, but it's that policy transmission mechanism that so often fails to work effectively across boundaries, and I think it's because it's a human challenge. It's not going to be solved necessarily by journals or even foundations. No matter what we do, it's that human thing of saying, this thing's worked here, how can we make it work in a very different context but recognize a commonality of lived experience that may be between these, these common different groups of people? Um, and that's the transmission thing. And I don't have an answer to that. I think it is a human interaction, though, when I've looked at it and experienced it. So is that, Alona, then about not, not expecting to have one solution in, in 
that can apply in many, many places, but perhaps taking a way of working, a way of thinking, a way of getting cross-disciplinary uh, approaches into localised solutions. Well, you know, I don't think we, we should get too carried away because if I take tobacco policy, we do know that certain key elements of tobacco policy work everywhere. Uh, and uh, therefore, there are public health instruments uh, that relate to law, that relate to more supportive environments, that uh, protect certain populations. We mustn't forget this protection element as well. They, they do work everywhere. And, uh, and I think it's also interesting that uh, uh, certain surveys show us that actually, at least you know, in, in my country, that uh, people would like to see more regulation in a whole number of areas, but they're not getting it politically. So uh, I because think- Because of vested interests? Because of vested interests, because of ideology, because you know, it just doesn't reach anybody, because, uh, and usually you know, the, the evidence is used in whatever way is just uh, applicable uh, for the political purpose that you have. I mean, people want a healthier environment. They might they have different interpretations of health. And uh, some are more individual, some are more collective, etc. But, you know, everybody wants a better life, particularly for their children. And, uh, and the fact is that uh, a lot of people who do have the power to influence that are not fulfilling their responsibilities. And the people... Uh, are not heard in what, uh, what they are asking them to do. And so I, I do think the, we need to think more about how that political process comes about, how those voices are heard, and how people do make themselves heard. And not only as you know, people confronted with a health problem, but as citizens. You know, this is an issue of citizenship. And we are not listening to people as citizens in relation to their and health. Can I ask the others then, is, is part of the difficulty in this is that we are so locked into the existing model of the hierarchy of evidence that actually cutting through in that political debate, in the public discourse, using any other kind of evidence is incredibly difficult? I, I mean, I think we, we're actually starting to change things now by, by using our communities and, and learning from them. I mean, some of the things, um, our dental contract around prevention has changed in Blackpool because um, of public health listening to us and, and listening to communities around what was needed. So I think the fact that we're actually able to work with our communities, we're a partnership, so we have all the public services in Blackpool working as a partnership, really um, dr drilling down into what's needed, what changes need to be happened. It is making a, ch a, a change nationally, and I think you know, we are big lottery funded. There's five sites in, in um, England looking at this research project over 10 years. That's got to make an impact because of the learning that's coming from that. We're actually looking at how that can actually be taken to other communities. I think we're working with the academics. We work with academics from around the world. Um, but our communities work with professors in Michigan and Oxford. You know, people in Blackpool never worked with professors in Oxford University. You know, mm -hmm. They didn't get O-levels. Um, but we're getting programs and we actually have communities working with those professors to co tailor them, co-designing. Or, you know, we, we have one, um, University of Michigan have a great program that we're starting to use. But we got the Ann Arbor version. Now, Ann Arbor is filled with, you know, mm. professionals mm. and, you know, doctorates. Mm. We have a reading age of 11, so the professors there were actually shocked that they had to change all their written material and that's changing things that's really changing the evidence so is this of what also, works is it also then about taking the academics to actually meet and engage with ordinary people so Absolutely. a couple of years ago we published a series on obesity and um, the, one of the arguments in that series was to promote this this notion of what they called strategic science and strategic science doesn't begin with the investigator. It's not about investigator-led science. It's about you begin with the agent of change, as they put it. So who in the community has the ability to change, whether it's at the individual level, the family level, the neighborhood level, um, or beyond that? But you start with that agent of change to define what the question is. 
And then once you've defined what the question is, is having listened to that community, then you begin to, that's what you fund. And then that's what you publish. And then after that, you don't just leave it at that. You then have to reconnect the evidence and the researchers with those agents of change. And then you get into a, a cycle. So, and I think that notion of where you begin the process is where we might rethink our approach. Um, too often, what we do is we say, oh, yes, it's all about implementation science. It's all about after you've done the research, you make the connection. No, no, no. You should start at the beginning with the connection. And that's the co-production bit. But that, to do that, though, you need to be clear on the thing, the population that you're trying to work with and, and quote, influence, and also the yeah. problems you're seeking to address, and where Alona's point comes in. So I think there is space in the model for really good top-down stuff, politically driven alongside really effective bottom-up community design services. It's creating the imperative that in this example, we say as a society, obesity is a massive problem for these reasons, and we need to throw everything we've got at it. And that's mm. the kind of thing that says then, well, when we commission research, we can start with a user-based approach mm. because we look at the population that needs the interventions to design mm. around those. Mm. But we also say at a national level, what are the three or four things that we can do? So, you know, more exercise in schools or a sugar tax but it may or not something be to else. Do, it may not be anything to do with obesity itself. So, I mean, actually, yeah, yeah. the most interesting Possibly. journal, much more interesting than The Lancet, is Social Science and Medicine because if you read that, then you really read about people's lives. And there, for example... Um, you know, you will see a lot of work that actually goes into communities and understands that actually the reason why people make choices about smoking or alcohol use or their diet are to do with the incredible social deprivation, the massive inequalities that they're dealing with, big, big social determinants of health. So we're going on saying change your diet, focus on obesity. We're looking at the wrong thing. We should be looking much more upstream at these very, very big political issues, and we we depoliticize public health because we want to talk about e-cigarettes or we want to talk about obesity. No, that is not the right approach. Understand the causal pathways for why people make choices, and that takes you to some big issues that we don't want to confront because we see them as too political. So how do you... Elodie, come in. Well, you know, that's exactly the point uh, I was trying to make, and the, poli the political li is at different levels. And also the fact that uh, where people make choices, I mean, they're in a context. I mean, every step that you take in a supermarket has been preordained. Mm -hmm. And uh, we talk about people's choices. I mean, those poor mothers, uh, poor in the sense of, uh, you know, uh, not having enough money, they didn't ask anybody to put stacks of ch chocolate uh, next to uh, to the checkout counter. So, uh, so I think you know there's a whole science out there that we haven't spoken about, that is all about behavior and behavior models mm. to get people to do certain kinds of things and make certain kinds of choices. And with social media, that has expanded even more in terms of, you know, sort of uh, incentive response mechanisms. And, uh, and the fact is that there is truly an enormous amount of money in that system, as we have, we have heard from one of the speakers. Mm -hmm. And that has to be addressed. And to bring that together in a, in a variety of ways, to act at a, a political responsible level of... Uh, you know, really getting responsible behavior, not always from individuals, but from companies, from politicians, from community leaders. That is what we need to be discussing, and that is a deeply political issue, which is why, you know, we like to speak about the political determinants of health and those political choices. And, uh, and that's why, in terms of research and analyses, that's where we need much more knowledge, because people have a right to know that. Nobody tells them that, you know, this is, this is why you walk through the supermarket like this and not like this, and yeah. that's why you're buying that and not that. The, the power of many influences to make, to influence our, our choices in everyday life. We've had a fantastic discussion prompted by our five contributors, I'm going to force you. No, uh, no you can't do that. Yeah, no, I'm afraid, I'm afraid no. these are my instructions. No. Um, th th they've all c contributed brilliantly to this evening's discussion in different ways. But I'm going to ask you, the four of you, you're going to have to 
to choose someone who, for you tonight, just on this evening, most engaged you with a different way of thinking about this? <laughs> Richard, oh, you're, used, oh. you're used to, to having to make hard decisions. Uh, yeah, um, okay. Well, I'm I am going to go for Marissa. I'm going to go for Marissa because I think this privileging of the person, issues around the expression, performance, collaboration, I mean, this is where I think public health needs to go. Meryl? Um, I'm not going to go for Marissa, but she's the first I actually really agree with. It's, it's <laughs> absolutely where I am. But if I'm thinking differently, mm. I have to say Brendan. Um, Brendan made me think very differently around design. Um, and, and that was really useful. It was about looking at solutions from unconventional sources, um, thinking outside the box. I think also the child focus part that, that you had was, was really, really, in, really interesting. But also the challenge in engaging different groups to come in. So in, in terms of challenging my thinking, um, Brendan, Brendan challenged my thinking. Hello. <laughs> well, I'll go for Corinne because uh, she showed us how you have to address a wicked problem and that you actually have to come at it you know, from different points. And I think she showed us, and that's something I find incredibly important, uh, what's actually behind a packet of gummy bears. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think we have to be much more aware of what's behind a packet of gummy bears. And we don't spend enough time on that. There's some professor who said, you know, one of the most political choices we make every day is what we eat. And, uh, and I think at least for those of us who, uh, uh, who have choices, not everybody has choices. Uh, those of us who have choices, we should be much more political about that choice. Ed. So this is not just to be fair, but. Um, <laughs> so Alex, channeling Richard Horton, which I hate doing, but one frequently <laughs> does. When you said childhood and obesity are a constructed concept, and when you said, actually, pull yourself right back to thinking about an entirely different way of thinking about policy and how policy is operated, and almost use the lens of time to look at a system from even further outside than some of the other speakers have spoken about, that was a really powerful perspective, I thought. And, and for me, whilst you know I got a huge amount out of each one, and it's made me rethink what I do, which doesn't take much, but this, this sense of going, just look at the whole system and look at actually those things that you take to be completely done deals. They're not, and they weren't. And that's what we partly need to do when we think about further and further and further and further upstream determinants of really complex and wicked social problems. Um, and while I don't think history necessarily has all the answers, that mechanism of standing so far back that you go, actually, start from, some, start from nothing, that's really powerful. And that, that for me, gave me something different to, to think about too. <coughs> Okay, well, that, that puts me in an impossible uh, d <laughs> position. But, but I think on the basis of the, the card vote here and also from the live stream, Marisa, I think it's, it's going to have to be you for engaging the audience tonight uh, with, with your speech. So please, if you'd like to come up. <laughs> Thank you very much for joining us here this evening. It's and, and well, <laughs> perhaps, <laughs> after, perhaps after the uh, no doubt extremely healthy bottle in that <laughs> in that bag. <laughs> um, thank you very much indeed to, to everyone here and to everyone who's joined us on the live stream. Uh, just a reminder for everyone who is here, uh, please, if you go next door, our five fantastic contributors will be there. And we want the debate and the discussion to go on. They're there to take questions, to explain more about their thinking and ideas. We hope you have a really good conversation. Thank you very much indeed, and to our panel as well. Thank you.